The history of rigid airships is a story full of excitement and adventure. Man's struggle to conquer the air started with lighter than aircraft, and a good deal of the basic knowledge which made the United States the leader in general aeronautics was gained by the pioneers of the airship. The rigid airship not only has its part in the history of aircraft, but can fulfill important functions in future military and commercial air transportation. The first thought in many minds when talking about rigid airships is the terrible accident of the Hindenburg. After a successful career as a passenger and cargo ship, the Hindenburg on May 6, 1937, caught fire at Lakehurst. Miraculously, most of those aboard the Hindenburg were saved. 62 out of 97 came out of that inferno alive. The cause of the fire has never been determined. The Board of Investigation reported, The theory that a brush discharge, St. Elmo's fire, ignited a mixture of hydrogen, appears most probable. Other well-qualified authorities feel that the fire was an act of sabotage. However, it must be kept in mind that the big flaw, and inevitably the fatal defect in the German scheme of things, was that these big ships had to be inflated with hydrogen, which is a highly inflammable gas. In any case, the disaster put an end for the time being to the commercial operation of rigid airships. Back in 1897, the inventor Schwartz created what was technically the world's first rigid airship. It was all aluminum, a way ahead of its time. The real father of the rigid was Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin, a retired German army officer. Zeppelin served as an observer with the Federal Balloon Company in the American Civil War. Based on his experiences with balloons, he later conceived the idea of the rigid airship. Several balloons, or gas cells, afforded a compartmentation scheme similar to that used in surface ships to localize loss of buoyancy in the event of damage. The structure to hold the balloons, then as now, consisted of a series of transverse frames, longitudinal girders, bracing wires, and gas cell wires. The first practical rigid, the LZ-1, flew for the first time on July 2nd, 1900. Vertical control was aided by a suspended sliding weight. A few early Zeppelins were operated from floating hangars, which automatically weather vanes. Thus, docking and undocking could always be carried out in the wind direction. But such maneuvers on water were not simple, and gave way to improved methods and hangars on shore. Doors proved one of the toughest problems. Sticking out like huge ears, they disturbed normal airflow and sometimes set up dangerous eddies and gusts. The orange field type was an improvement. The doors rolled back against the main building.
The telescopic door was even better. It was an engineering achievement to slide the giant panels one behind the other easily and quickly. These disappearing doors set up no turbulence. But in the early days, the answer was canvas or no doors at all. Gradually, Count Zeppelin gathered around him a number of talented co-workers, notably Dr. Hugo Eckner, who became not only a famous airship skipper, but also the leader of German airship development. Dr. Ludwig Dürr, designer responsible for many important Zeppelin engineering features. Dr. Karl Arnstein, who became an American citizen and has continued his airship work in the United States. And Captain Ernest Lehman, Zeppelin raider in World War I and the first skipper of the Hindenburg. In 1910, Zeppelin founded the world's first regularly organized air transport concern, the German Airship Navigation Company, known as Daylight. The early passenger airships, Deutschland, Schwaben, Victoria Louise, and others, were equipped not only with promenade decks, but also restaurant and cabin facilities. Thousands of passengers were carried hundreds of thousands of miles with a perfect passenger safety record. The Zeppelin's only real rival was the Chute Lance airship, cigar-shaped and with a framework of wood. Twenty Chute Lance ships were built, but with the outbreak of World War I, production was standardized on designs of the Zeppelin type and principles. The Germans had a powerful new weapon, the long-range Zeppelin, developed by their commercial airship company. The German army made limited use of rigid airships, but the German navy used them to a greater extent. One notable Zeppelin flight was a voyage of over 4,000 miles non-stop from Bulgaria to German East Africa and back, most of the trip over unfriendly territory, adding to the hazard. The use of the airship as a weapon caught the Allies unprepared. For the first time in history, it was possible to carry a large cargo of bombs hundreds of miles by air to enemy territory. As a countermeasure, the Allies were forced to use the airplane. But the tremendous advantage of the Zepp in range and carrying capacity continued to make them a constant threat. In a few raids over England, the Germans tried out an ingenious cloud car, or spy battle. This was a very good idea and extremely effective under the right conditions. The Zeppelin, hidden in the clouds, was reasonably safe from attack and discovery. There was opportunity for accurate observation, the observer telephoning his findings to the ship. The tactical value of the Zepp was proved in the Battle of Jutland, when information about the British fleet was radioed to the German fleet command. This is attested in an official British report. It is no small achievement for their Zeppelins to have saved the German high seas fleet at the Battle of Jutland. Planes, anti-aircraft, and especially means for setting their hydrogen afire, finally stopped virtually all raids over England. But the scouting activities of the Zeppelins continued. During four years of war, the Germans made over 300 raids and a thousand scouting missions. Summed up, 10% were bombing flights and 90% strictly naval sorties. They used 116 rigid airships during the war. About a third of these were lost due to pioneering defects or inexperience in handling. Allied guns and planes brought down another third. 
The remaining third were decommissioned intact. Surprisingly enough, only 441 German airship officers and men were lost in four years of war. The British started their wartime airship program late and could only attempt to copy the German design from meager information. However, the Allies later were lucky enough to bring down a couple of German war zeppelins almost intact, and they studied these diligently. When the war ended, the Allies distributed amongst themselves the remaining German airships, giving them further material for study. As a result, in 1919, the British completed the R-34, a Zeppelin copy. Pleased and proud, they immediately flew her westward over the Atlantic. Her landing at Mineola, Long Island, marked the world's first non-stop transatlantic air crossing between England and the United States. The R-33, sister ship of the 34, was used mostly for experiments. She was the first rigid to carry an airplane from the ground and launch it in flight. An unpremeditated incident, a break from the mast in a high wind, proved she could take it. Broken nose and all, she came home safely. This proved the value of Zeppelin's compartmentation scheme. In 1921, the U.S. Navy purchased the R-38, or ZR-2, from the British. This ship was designed primarily for high altitude use. However, during her builder's trials, she was admittedly maneuvered severely at low altitude. Under aerodynamic loads for which she was not intended, her structure failed. Her hydrogen burst into flames, and she became a total loss. At this point, the British decided to get away from Zeppelin copies. The R-100 and R-101, completed in the late 20s, were designed from scratch and intended for passenger service in the British Empire communication system. The R-100 made several successful flights through pretty rough weather, including a transatlantic round trip in August 1930 between England and Montreal. The R-101 was not so fortunate. No sooner was she built than it was decided to cut her in two and add an extra section to provide more lift. Before being adequately tested, she was rushed off on a demonstration trip to India. Faulty gas valves and a crude ballast system undoubtedly contributed to her getting out of control. She crashed into a hill in France and hydrogen fire consumed her. Tragic testimony to too much haste. This ended British airship efforts. In the United States, Admiral Moffat, the grand old man of Navy lighter than air, championed the rigid airship. He had a great ambition to see his country become the world leader. The first American-built rigid was the ZR-1, or Shenandoah. Structural parts were fabricated at the Naval Aircraft Factory in Philadelphia and assembled in the original large hangar at the Naval Air Station, Lakehurst, New Jersey. Completed in September 1923, the Shenandoah was a modified copy of the 1916 Zeppelin L-49, captured in France. The Shenandoah was a particularly important ship, not because she was up to date, but because she was the first native-built, homegrown American rigid. She made her first flight in September 1923 and flew at sea and over many parts of the country in the next two years through a wide variety of weather. In some respects, the Shenandoah was a rugged ship. In January 1924, because of a jam mooring spindle, the 74-mile gale tore her from the high mast at Lakehurst, leaving part of her bow structure dangling at the masthead. She was brought back safely, even though her two forward gas cells were deflated and much cover torn from her upper fin. The Shenandoah was the first rigid airship to moor to a floating mast, such as the U.S. Navy devised and installed on the tanker Potoka. Another of her pioneering ventures 
was a 9,000 mile trip in the fall of 1924 around the periphery of the United States by way of mooring masts at Fort Worth, Texas, San Diego, California, and Fort Lewis, Washington. The Shenandoah was lost in the line squall near Ava, Ohio on September 3, 1925. Fourteen men, including Lieutenant Commander Zachary Lansdowne, were killed. The forward section, with eight men under Lieutenant Commander Rosendahl, was free ballooned for more than an hour and landed safely. The Court of Inquiry reported, The final destruction of the ship was due primarily to large, unbalanced external aerodynamic forces arising from high-velocity air currents. Investigation reveals that the removal of certain helium safety valves may have permitted excessive helium pressure to crush part of the structure. Inadequate weather information may have obscured the existence of treacherous fronts along the projected flight. Nevertheless, some valuable lessons were learned. Build airships with a lower slenderness ratio, length to maximum diameter. This makes a stronger ship. Build a control car as part of the hull, so it can't be torn away. Put the engines inside the hull. This gives better streamlining and makes the engines more accessible. All these and other improvements were realized in the later ships, Akron and Macon. Meanwhile, as part of her reparations, Germany had been required to build an airship for the United States. The ZR-3 arrived at Lakehurst, October 15, 1924, and was christened the Los Angeles. In January of 1928, off Newport, Rhode Island, the Los Angeles landed on the flight deck of the carrier Saratoga. In spite of greeting her welcomers by dropping water ballast on the handling crew, the experiment proved the landing maneuver successful. The following month, the Los Angeles made the first non-stop flight from New York City to Panama, 2,250 statute miles in a day and a half. In 1929, she hooked on an airplane in flight. Here was a revolutionary advancement, opening up a tremendous new field of possibilities. The airship and the airplane, working together in this manner, could perform many useful functions neither one could perform alone. The speed and maneuverability of the airplane complemented the longer range and larger carrying capacity of the airship. Demonstrating independence of land-based facilities, the Los Angeles in 1931 operated for three weeks from the tanker Potoka. She was away from Lakehurst 27 days, flying over 14,000 miles. The Los Angeles became a flying laboratory and schoolroom, but her operational use was limited, for in the early days, the Navy didn't have much helium. Will Rogers summed it up nicely. The Navy has two airships and only one set of helium. Nevertheless, the Los Angeles made 331 flights for a total of 4,320 hours. 
A so-called economy wave ended her flying career in 1932. But experiments continued on the ground until at last in 1939, though still possessed of useful life, she was dismantled after certain structural tests were made. However, the rigid airship program of the United States received new impetus from pressure exerted by far-sighted Americans in the inauguration of the five-year aircraft building program of 1926, which included two rigid airships of approximately six million cubic feet each to be used as adjuncts of the fleet. In 1928, after winning a national competition for the design of these ships, the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation of Akron, Ohio, was authorized to build them. And the Navy Appropriation Act of 1929 provided $8 million for their construction. In building more than one craft at a time, a big saving is affected by the spreading of engineering and development costs. Thus, while the first ship, the Akron, cost $5,358,000, her sister ship cost only $2,600,000, or about half as much. Several innovations were introduced. Instead of a single keel, Zeppelin style, the Akron and Macon had three, providing greater strength. The eight propellers were built so they would not only reverse, but also swivel through a 90 degree arc so the ship could be pushed up, down, ahead, or astern. The weight of fuel expended was counterbalanced by an ingenious condenser that recovered water from the exhaust gas of the engine. The Akron made her first flight September 1931. Her Navy designation was ZRF-4, ZR for Zeppelin Rigid and S for Scout. The airplane airship teamwork, inaugurated with the Los Angeles, was carried a great deal further with the Akron and Macon. They each carried five naval planes and a built-in hangar. The planes were taken aboard and released by means of a trapeze device. The maneuver became a part of regular operating routine. In a year and a half of service, the Akron piled up 1,700 flight hours in 74 flights. Her trips covered the entire Atlantic and Pacific coasts and many states in between. She went over Cuba and to the Canal Zone. She took part in exercises with the fleet and made many experimental and training flights. The Akron was destroyed in a storm off the Atlantic coast April 4th, 1933. Almost all aboard were lost, including Admiral Moffat. The most likely explanation is that the ship was unwittingly maneuvered so close to the surface that her tail hit the water. Suspicion of structural failure is not corroborated by direct evidence. It is significant that airships have weathered worse turbulence. In any case, it should be kept in mind that later scientific developments probably would have prevented the loss of the Akron. For one thing, detailed weather information as is now available enables a ship to avoid storm areas that are dangerous. Further, at the time of the Akron, altitude was indicated simply by a barometer calibrated in feet. This is not necessarily the true altitude. For instance, it is known that at one time the altimeter read 1,600 feet, while the Akron was actually no more than 1,280 feet above the surface. In modern aircraft, altitude is registered by radio altimeters, which do indicate true altitude. and other electronic devices, such as LORAN and radar, have greatly increased flight safety. The Macon, 
sister ship of the Akron, was under construction at the time of the Akron crash. She was commissioned in 1933 and based at the Naval Air Station, Sunnyvale, California, which later became Moffett Field. In the next year and a half, the Macon made 54 flights, flew 1,800 hours, and more than 90,000 nautical miles. She launched and recovered her own planes in flight, and by night, in foul weather and fair, a great advancement in this technique. In 1934, an incipient structural failure during flight was detected in the stern. Temporary repairs were made, but it was decided that permanent local strengthening could safely be postponed until completion of scheduled maneuvers with the fleet. On February 12, 1935, with a day's fleet exercises successfully concluded, the Macon headed home to Moffett Field. As the ship turned to avoid a squall, the upper fin tore from its forward support, and two gas cells in the stern were ripped open. The loss of helium declined the stern of the ship sharply. The engines drove the Macon above the pressure ceiling, and more helium poured out through safety valves. In the brief time available, it was impossible to drop enough weight to make up for the lost helium. The big ship slipped slowly into the sea. The one bright spot in the event was the abandoned ship maneuver. Only two were lost of the crew of 83. Hindsight shows it was an error in judgment not to have laid the ship up for permanent correction of the difficulties when they first appeared. but the fleet exercises demanded the services of our only airship. It is obvious that no single unit of the fleet is sufficient to prove the type. There must be other ships for replacements and to carry on simultaneous and competitive developments. The United States, having operated only four rigid ships, nevertheless made a major contribution, improved ground handling equipment and technique. Originally, it was accustomed to rely entirely on manpower in ground handling. The British introduced the high mooring mast, which was later utilized by the United States. However, the high mast was unsatisfactory because the moored ship is difficult to service and must be kept in constant flying trim. Even so, air turbulence is unpredictable. This is what happened to the Los Angeles. The giant swing of the Los Angeles hastened the development of the low or stub mass. And the taxi wheel at the stern was replaced by a riding out car which prevented the stern from rising until released. The modernized mechanical docking of the Macon, using stub masts, moving on tracks, was certainly an improvement over earlier European methods. Meanwhile, Germany had developed a new commercial airship. The Graf Zeppelin, was the first to be put in service September 1928. The Graf didn't use gasoline. Instead, her five Maybach engines were driven by Blaugas, a hydrocarbon fuel gas of about the same density as air. The Germans had such complete confidence in the ship that they immediately sent her on a lengthy flight with 20 passengers, freight and mail, across the Atlantic and back. The Graf more than justified such confidence. In the next six years, she made many a round trip to South America, with time out in 1929 for a world cruise, not just as a stunt, but with a payload of 6,000 pounds in passengers, mail and baggage. Lakehurst to Friedrichshafen. to Tokyo. To 
Los Angeles. And back to Lakers. Here's the record. The Graf Zeppelin was finally removed from service in 1937, after the Hindenburg fire, because Germany had no helium. However, the Graf remains an impressive argument for commercial rigid airships. Here are the nine-year totals. This outstanding record achieved with no casualties, not even an injury. The LZ-129, the Hindenburg, was placed in service in May 1936. From May to October of that year, the Hindenburg made 10 transatlantic round trips between Frankfurt and Lakers, plus several round trips to South America. Accommodations included freshly prepared meals, state rooms, shower, promenades, writing room, lounge with grand piano, smoking room, and bar. In vibrationless, the big airship provided the acknowledged maximum comfort in oceanic travel. Besides passengers and mail, the ship carried a great variety of cargo, ranging from canaries to automobiles, airplanes, and heavy machinery. Between March and December 1936, the Hindenburg flew over 200,000 miles, carried 3,000 passengers, and 41,000 pounds of mail and freight. She never missed a scheduled flight and never turned back. The Germans had demonstrated that the commercial rigid airship was an extremely comfortable method of travel, far faster than the steamship, regular in schedules, and reasonable in price. But even more important, the rigid airship was safe. Why did Germany fare so well, whereas England and the United States had airship trouble? Experience and continuity seemed to be the principal reason. Only 157 rigid airships were ever built, and Germany built 138 of them. England built 16, and the United States only three. Though we have learned and contributed much, the United States has remained in the pioneering stage in the use of big airships. Summarizing briefly, official United States interest in rigid airships began with Admiral Dewey and the General Board in 1916. Since 1920, by joint agreement with the Army, the Navy has been custodian of development of both naval and commercial rigid airships although we have never had a commercial rigid airship. The 1938 Naval Expansion Bill authorized the expenditure of $3 million for the construction of a rigid airship, not to exceed 3 million cubic feet, to be used for training, experimental, and development purposes. However, official interpretation limited this airship to about 300 feet, an impossible length for a ship of such volume. Subsequently, three ships of one million cubic feet each would have been permitted. But ships of this size are useless for training purposes. Such limitations made it difficult to continue the program. Naval policy toward the rigid airship, however, has remained essentially positive and was restated in 1940. To build and maintain rigid airships, as necessary to explore and develop the usefulness for naval purposes, and to cooperate with other agencies in developing commercial airships. A group of America's most eminent scientists and engineers gave their considered endorsement to rigid airships. These distinguished authorities declared, it is the unanimous opinion of this committee that airships give promise of useful and effective service, both commercial and naval, 
and require a continuing program of construction and use. Men seem destined to learn some things only through bitter experience. Airship development, too, has had its setbacks from human causes. In every major airship accident, some human mistakes and inadequacies have been apparent. American lighter-than-air research has been continued by private interests, the Guggenheim Airship Institute, and to some extent by the Navy. Many tests are conducted. In this water course test, jets of water simulate air currents and show on a 12-foot airship model the effects of various types of air turbulence. Other tests furnish information concerning strength and weight factors of the newer light alloys. Also, it should be remembered that many advancements in heavier than air pass on their benefits to lighter than air. Better power plants, improved construction methods and materials, and the general field of aeronautical engineering. The size of the rigid airship starting with the LZ-1 of 338,410 cubic feet, has steadily increased with the growth of aeronautical knowledge. The larger airships not only have greater performance, but also increase in efficiency in proportion to size. Designers now have on the drawing boards plans for a 10 million cubic foot rigid airship. The major use of such a ship in either military or commercial service would be on long overwater hops. It will have a top speed of 90 miles an hour. At a cruising speed of 75 miles an hour, it could cover 6,000 miles non-stop with a payload capacity of 90,000 pounds. Over a 4,000 mile route, the payload would be 130,000 pounds. This represents a carrying capacity of more than 300 combat troops, or more than a dozen fighter planes, or over 200 hospital patients. As a commercial ship, it could provide 232 passengers with Pullman-like accommodations, or well over 100 passengers with all the comforts of a luxury liner but free from seasickness or air sickness. Comfort is one of the rigid airship's greatest contributions. Accommodations would include staterooms, promenade decks, lounges, library, restaurant, and bar. The unique ability to pick up and land passengers or cargo en route, already proved by the Akron and Macon, will be an additional facility of these ships. The proposed ship will, of course, contain helium, so that a disaster such as the Hindenburgs could never happen again. Even with hydrogen, the safety record of commercial rigid airships surpasses that of any other form of transportation. Over 51,000 passengers carried more than one and a quarter million miles with not a single casualty until the Hindenburg fire. The airship's place in commerce will fill the great gap between the slow surface vessel and the fast airplane. It provides the greatest comfort at costs lower than airplane travel. The records show that the airship is feasible, safe, and economical. Airships have been of definite military value and of commercial benefit. The United States has the know-how, the industrial capacity, and a nucleus of experienced airship personnel. Above all, we are the only country with an abundance of helium, the one completely safe lifting gas. These advantages combined with the recognized lessons of the past, can readily make the United States the world leader in airships of the future.